Okay, the next style that we're going to talk about is the Baroque. And the Baroque in some ways is just a catch-all word for things that happened in the 17th century. Uh, and we're going to start in Italy and Spain for the obvious reason that this style seems to start in Italy. So the word, as you might imagine, kind of like when we talked about Gothic, is actually a, an insult of sorts of later art historians. Again, in the 19th century, they have issues with practically every art style that we look at. And uh, the Baroque means irregular, contorted, or grotesque. Uh, so it's difficult to classify. In other words, we're going to see a lot of different things going on. There are going to be some threads that are going to bring some of the art together. Um, but we are going to see a lot of different styles depending on where we're at. So during this time, we see a few things happen. Uh, first off, there's a certain amount of strength in Catholicism. And that's not like a thing that's coming from below necessarily from um, everyday Catholics, but more it's due to the backlash of the Protestant Reformation. So in the 16th century um, in Germany and then in what is today the United Kingdom in England, uh, people broke away from the church. In England, it was Henry VIII who was the king uh, and he did it for straight, you might've learned in school he did it so he could get a divorce. But that's not the real reason he did it because he wanted to concentrate power in his own hands and take it away from the church that had power um, on the island that is England. And then in Germany, it was basically for the same reason. Uh, but it was from Martin Luther who did it for religious reasons, uh, but the political people that supported him did it for political reasons. So think of that in the same way with... Um, the kind of counter-reformation, which is Catholics um, kind of fighting back against uh, the Reformation where people left the Catholic Church. Um, and that is also, there's people who did it, and we're going to see some examples in a very sincere way and believed in making spirituality um, more down the earth and something that people could relate to and that they could have mystical, um, incredible experiences. Um, but at the same time, it's also motivated by the church that sees their power sl slipping away in Europe uh, and wants to make sure that they don't lose that power. Um, so we're going to kind of see both um, ideas coming. We're going to see people that take the spiritual ideas very seriously. Uh, and we're going to see how people with power use uh, these types of spiritual ideas and arts is one of the ways that you can communicate it. Um, for their own kind of um, political ends. So this is also a time when Europe is changing. And part of the reason is probably because of European imperialism. Uh, they were able to get more wealthy, um, especially coming to the so-called New World, uh, which wasn't new for the Native Americans that had been there for a long time. Uh, and some of the states were able to rise up with the money and resources that they were able to steal um, from Native Americans and from their lands. So one of the results of that uh, was, and this had been going on even before um, the imperialist era, is absolutism. We see that European leaders uh, start to get strong centralized states. So in France, in England, um, but not in Italy and Germany. And that's for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, it's not super important for us to go over the reasons <laughs> for this class, uh, but they both states didn't become Italy and Germany until the 19th century. Uh, so this kind of um, dynamic will continue. But since we do have powerful um, leaders in some of the states like France and England, we see a lot of money coming from elites into creating art. So we're going to see some pretty grand art, some literally huge paintings. Uh, <laughs> and that's what you see. Uh, people with power tend to think bigger is better. I'm thinking of someone right now. So it was some summer, somewhat separated from science compared to the Renaissance. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, part of the reason is that new sciences uh, change perceptions. Uh, and... This is the time when we really start to see um, science in a Western sense 
uh, and which is like pretty much embraced by the whole world, develop. And uh, some of the results of this scientific work are non-intuitive. So there are things that don't seem to be the case if we just use our eyes or we think about how things work in our everyday life. Uh, but these scientists um, came up with methodologies that allow you to come to conclusions that are non-intuitive. So the first one is heliocentrism, which means uh, instead of everything revolving around the earth, that the earth revolves around the sun. And many people had been noticing that this is probably the case for a couple of thousand years all around the world in different parts of the world. Uh, but it wasn't until um, this time period when it became accepted by most people. Also, the laws of gravity law probably isn't the, the best word here. Um, but that was very non-intuitive because um, once it was explained uh, and Newton had developed it, um, it was very effective in explaining what was going on, uh, how the planets moved, um, and how things worked on Earth. Uh, but it also seemed very strange because most of the time when we think about things working, we say if something's going to affect something, it's going to touch it. And with gravity, there didn't seem to be anything that was touching anything. It just seemed that there was a force that you couldn't see uh, that acted on other items. And Newton, like I said, his equations explained it very precisely, um, not quite as precisely as it could be. We'll talk about that later on. But incredibly precisely compared to what other people had done. But he himself was confused. He didn't really understand the mechanism. He couldn't think of, he couldn't think of the thing touching the other thing that made gravity happen. Uh, and he even said in his book, uh, as far as the mechanism for this, I leave that up to the reader. He was just kind of confused. And then ideas of metaphysics. Uh, and metaphysics is basically... Um, thinking of the world, why it's there, why things are, um, that's metaphysics. Like putting physics in there seems like it's a philosophy. Um, so some of the scientists and philosophers, and some of them were both, uh, that came up with some of these ideas are Copernicus, uh, who was one of the first people to really show exactly why uh, heliocentrism was true. Uh, Kepler, was able to come up with equations that explain the dynamics of the movements of planets and other astronomical objects eventually. Um, then Galileo, uh, who did studies on gravity, um, he worked on some of the first telescopes. Uh, he was the first person to see some of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and <clears throat> he was also one of the main people that convinced uh, the rest of the world about heliocentrism. And then Descartes, uh, he's most famous for that thought of, I think, therefore I am. So in other words, Descartes, he was trying to think scientifically and think, what can I know for sure? And what can I not be sure about? And he figured out that really the only thing he can know for sure is that he is thinking about this. And everything else, he thought of things like, almost like the Matrix, if you've seen that movie. Uh, he thought, well, there could be some kind of wizard that is creating this illusion in front of me. So I couldn't know if everything out there for sure is real. But I know I'm thinking about this, so I know that's real. Uh, he was also interested in science uh, and really tried to think about what the implications were of some of these new scientific discoveries. And then Newton uh, was by far the most important scientist of this time period. Uh, he came up with, a, like I said, the laws of gravitation, um, lots of other um, kind of physical phenomena he was able to explain. Uh, and he came up with new mathematics called calculus, uh, which if you had to take it in school, you might be annoyed by, but it's very useful in understanding um, how the world works. So um, Jansen says their cosmology, and cosmology, the way the word is used here, it means uh, a view of how the universe works, broke the ties between perception and science. And that's pretty important because um, not only did it break the ties between perception and science, in other words, things seem to be this way, but then science is showing me, no, it's actually something different. And that'll continue in increasingly weird ways, and we'll talk about it in the class. 
But it also eventually we get to the point that science is so complex um, that most people who are doing other sorts of things um, can't understand what's going on in science. So the idea of the Renaissance person uh, is starting to disappear. And part of that has to do with people only have so much time in their life to understand complex subjects. Um, but also part of it is due to this counter-reformation. One of the ways that um, the Catholic Church realized that Protestants were very appealing is they tried to appeal to people's everyday experience and make something um, that have kind of a closer spiritual connection um, with religious ideas. So um, part of it is, you know, if you're going to have spiritual collection um, connections, uh, at this time, it wouldn't thought to be scientific, something that is going in, on inside of you uh, and is subjective, meaning it's something that you have in your own head, uh, but it may be a different experience for somebody else. So part of this separation is it's really hard to understand science at this time, but part of it is also um, kind of a response to what's going on in the world. Uh, and artists, you know, they're going to respond to trends just like anybody else. So the first artist we'll look at in this section, and the most influential as far as the style that's usually associated with the early Baroque uh, is Caravaggio. Caravaggio originally became famous in Rome uh, and started to be influential in Rome. So in some ways, we can look at the Baroque as starting in Rome. But if you're thinking of Rome now, and if you're to go there now, you'd see this incredible city, it's beautiful everywhere. Or if you think of like ancient Roman times, uh, that's not what Rome was like at this time. Uh, it had basically fallen into ruin. Uh, there were very few people living in Rome. Uh, the only nice places that were left uh, was basically around the areas that the Pope um, was using. And the rest of Rome was full of people who were struggling to get by. Uh, and there was a lot of crime and violence. Uh, the city wasn't particularly clean. And if you were living there, <laughs> it wasn't exactly the easiest life. Uh, so like in a lot of places that are like this, um, you know, you tend to have like gangsters, uh, but even just regular people would be more likely to get in the fights or experience violence. Um, and that's the world that Caravaggio is living in when he goes to Rome. So around 1600, Rome became the fountainhead of the Baroque, and that fountainhead is really Caravaggio. In this picture, um, we're seeing Matthew, who is a tax collector. Uh, he's one of the 12 apostles of Jesus. And in the Gospels, um, Jesus calls these apostles. And he calls people that are purposely not ex exactly like who we consider to be like the most spiritual or even good people. Uh, and a tax collector is a pretty good example. In Jesus's time, um, he's Jewish and Jewish people are living um, in the Roman Empire. So they've been taken over by this foreign power. And the tax collectors work for the Romans. So as you imagine, being a tax collector would be about the least popular job you could possibly pick. Uh, people would think that you are horrible. Um, you're basically selling out your own people and working for this evil empire that has taken away so much. But you may have noticed already when you're looking at it, the people at this table, they're not dressed like we usually see biblical figures dressed. Uh, instead, we're seeing him dressed like Romans during Caravaggio's time, uh, the type of people that he would see on the street. And you can see that he has a sword on its side. So some of these people are ready to fight. Uh, and a little bit like dandies, meaning people that are like a little bit overdressed. That often happen in these types of areas as well. This picture is interesting because when you first look at it, um, people don't necessarily have a part of the picture that they first look at. But then if you kind of step back, oftentimes people will see <clears throat> this light as being a line 
And it's leading towards this figure who is Matthew, who's counting money. He's a tax collector. And we see underneath the line, as if he's forcing the light into Matthew himself, we see Jesus and his hand comes out and the light follows as if coming from his hand. Uh, and when we can see how some of the figures are kind of interested, we're seeing that idea with Leonardo, you got to express things through gestures. Um, and we see some pointing going on and everybody else is kind of interested in what's going on. So Jansen says, never have we seen a sacred subject depicted so entirely in terms of contemporary low life. Hey, Jansen, chill out. They're not low life. They're just trying to survive. Uh, so this picture, when it was made, uh, it was commissioned by the church, um, by the Catholic church, but they originally refused it because they didn't really like an important subject like this being portrayed with contemporary people. But on top of that, also people who would be considered to be gangsters or criminals or just like violent young men. Um, and Caravaggio was one of these. Uh, he killed a friend in a duel and that's kind of going to affect his life and eventually lead to his death later on. So what Caravaggio is doing is a couple of things. Uh, first off, we see the tenebrism uh, that we had seen in Tintoretto um, only a few years before this. Uh, and remember, tenebrism is when you have um, very dark and very light, and it's more extreme than we had seen previously. Uh, so when you get in close, it has this effect because everything's dark. Uh, and when you stand up to the painting, this is right at the bottom of the painting, it has this like kind of close-in effect. Like we're sitting at the table uh, right next to Matthew and all his boys, uh, or just pretty cool, right? Then we see Jesus, uh, and he's a little distant compared to the other figures. Uh, but this light, it seems to have a meaning. It's like the light that Jesus is bringing to this tax collector who is um, probably not doing the best things in his life. Uh, but the gesture is kind of Renaissance in that you know, people don't normally point in this very graceful way. And you can see it with his other hand too, it's kind of dramatic. Um, so add that up with the extreme light. Think about like in, in a play or a movie when they want to make things seem really dramatic. They'll have very dark, dark and very light lights. Uh, but this gesture is also not particularly natural. Uh, it's meant to be dramatic. So the light unifies the picture. It adds significance to Christ's gesture. There's often this idea of spirituality of Christ being like a light that he brings into people's world. Uh, and although at first this was refused, people realized um, in the church, people of power, they said, you know, we have to do whatever we can to stop people from leaving the church. Uh, so one of the ways they could do it is kind of related to people's everyday experience. You might imagine if you're someone that's growing up in Rome or another city that's crowded and dirty uh, and your life isn't so great, uh, that you might want to have an experience that you can relate to. Uh, so we can see that idea in the Council of Reformation. It eventually becomes what everyone does. So a direct personal experience of God open to all even to these guys who are hanging out in bars, getting wasted, gambling, and getting in the fights. Um, and these types of pictures are eventually going to appeal to Protestants as well. Um, some Protestants aren't a big fan of pictures, uh, and it's not necessary to know why in this class, uh, but other ones are, and we'll kind of see how this affects um, the Protestants as well, who some of which um, get into very spiritual sex. Um, so... This is Caravaggio's The Conversion of St. Paul. And again, this is about like an experience. Um, this particular story is a, is a kind of blazing, um, very um, tangible spiritual experience. Uh, it's so impressive that it literally knocks uh, the person off of their horse. Um, so The Conversion of St. Paul is a story about someone who lived after the time of Jesus, um, became very important and the earliest part of the church. Um, and he was um, Jewish, but he was a Roman citizen. So at first, when he saw the Christians, um, he said, these people you know, are horrible. They're going to break apart the empire, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so he's going on his horse from one city to the next. And you see that uh, Caravaggio dresses him as a Roman to show who he is. 
And um, he is kind of like blown off of his horse by light. Um, and it's literally kind of displayed here. We see this incredibly bright light. And it seems that Paul, um, who used to be Saul, Paul is just like kind of drinking it in, having this ecstatic experience. Um, so in the story, um, to symbolize his conversion, this is him basically, his seeing God moment, um, who was once Saul becomes Paul, uh, and he becomes the most um, influential and enthusiastic of Jesus' followers, even though he had never met Jesus in person. So um, some of the things that are going on with Caravaggio, again, some people like what he's doing because they see that it appeals to people in a way that other work hadn't. But other people are like, eh, we don't have to, they think it's like lowly to show things like this. So a number of his works were refused because they, uh, on the ground that they lack propriety, that is to say decorum, meaning they thought hmm, putting this important figure on a ground uh, next to a horse where he could possibly get pooped on uh, probably isn't the best way to do it. Uh, but it really matches the story. And again, we kind of feel like we're a part of this story because everything is so close to us. Um, so what's interesting, he did this with the previous painting as well. It's placed on a wall that uses natural light. So the window light comes in and it's during a certain time of day, the same as the light in the picture. So it would reinforce what's going on. Uh, that's why sometimes it's difficult to see these pictures in museums, first off, because they're huge, but it's also difficult to light them uh, because unless you light them in, as they were originally made, sometimes the details are difficult to see. So we have that tenebrism, dark and light, and it has a similar meaning. Um, it's, it's the power of a spiritual transformation of God. Uh, so you can see that in his face. It's almost like people have when they have um, an orgasm, for lack of a better word, uh, but perhaps more transformative. And so this one shows kind of where Caravaggio was going in life. So he um, seemed to be very religious, and he painted these very religious pictures. Uh, but in his regular life, he was tortured. Uh, the people around him, he was jealous and paranoid. Uh, he got into fights. Uh, he didn't feel like he was a very good person. <laughs> In some ways, he was right. He wasn't exactly a good person. Um, and he had gotten into a fight with someone, and um, he kind of challenged them to a fight. Uh, first, it was a verbal fight, and then he challenged them to a physical fight. And this person was a great swordsman. And Caravaggio was not. <laughs> But through the power of alcohol and passion, he killed this guy. Um, and in Rome, uh, depending on who you are, you could get away with murder. Um, like other cities that um, people are living in bad infrastructure, there's not a, the law sometimes doesn't mean much. Uh, but since Caravaggio was well known and the man he killed was also pretty well known and well liked, um, there were charges brought up and they tried to arrest him for murder. Instead, he escaped. Uh, and one of the paintings that he made to kind of make up for this uh, was this painting. So it's David and Goliath. And we told about, talked about the story before. And it's kind of the after part of the story. After David had cut off the head of Goliath. And um, he's using tenebrism again. It almost looks like it's on a stage and there's a spotlight here. Uh, and he's showing David is very young. Um, and could almost be a young Caravaggio. But when you look at Goliath's face, um, it's gruesome with his eyes going two different ways. Caravaggio had certainly seen people who had been hung uh, before executed. Um, we see a self-portrait of Caravaggio. Uh, so in a way, he's saying <laughs> this is his sacrifice to make up for his sins. Um, it didn't end up working out. He died in a tragic way. Um, if I can find a video uh, available for free on YouTube, I'll show you one where they kind of tell the story in a very dramatic and interesting way. But all of what Caravaggio brought, the drama, the kind of bringing us into a scene, um, having like real tangible experiences that are dramatic um, and using regular people in these stories, which really matches the original kind of 
um, vibe of, of the stories, uh, that becomes very influential. And the church kind of realizes this influences people. People like this. And other artists really like how dramatic and intense it is. So this is the first female artist that we're talking about, uh, Artemisia Janileski. Uh, and this is her most famous subject. When I tell you about her life, um, you may say, well, that kind of makes sense if she does that subject. Caravaggio had also been doing this subject because it's dramatic and violent and they love that kind of stuff. But I think to Janileski, it might have a more profound meaning. Um, so during the Baroque, uh, women first become prominent uh, artists. Before this time, there were artists in the Renaissance um, and even before in the medieval era. Um, in the medieval era, artists were just like craftspeople, so um, we don't really know the names. Uh, in the Renaissance, there was a few women, uh, but in Italy especially, it was highly patriarchal culture. Uh, so women were extremely limited in what they could do, uh, but when you try to limit what people want to do, oftentimes they'll they'll work to do it anyway. Uh, so during this time, the first women were admitted to Florence's Academia de, del Diseño, so that means School of Design, and um, women start to become prominent artists. So this story, I'll tell you the story, the biblical story first, uh, and then we'll go into the next story. Um, so by the way, if you um, are a Christian and you're from a Protestant background, um, this story, this book of the Bible, the book of Judith, isn't in your Bible. Uh, it was taken out by Martin Luther, um, but it's in the Bible that Catholics use and in the Bible that um, Orthodox people use, and it's also one of the texts that's considered to be pretty important to um, some sects in Judaism. So in this story, um, it's one of those kind of hero stories. Uh, and some of the ones from the Old Testament, the heroes are women, which might be one of the reasons why Martin Luther didn't like it. He had a very low opinion of women. Um, so in this one, Judith is our hero, uh, and the Assyrians had taken over um, the ancient Hebrews at this time. Um, and the Assyrian general, Holofernes, um, was threatening uh, more violence on the Hebrews. Um, so Judith, who was considered to be um, kind of the strongest and also the most beautiful um, young woman among uh, the ancient Hebrews in this area, um, she decides to take her and her maidservant, so Judith is the one with the sword, and her maidservant is a younger woman, um, and they decide to go to the camp of where this general is and all the other Syrians, so literally walk into the heart of the enemy, uh, and the Assyrians um, see these two women coming up and they think they're really hot. So they let them in uh, and they make their way to the general and they heard that he likes to get drunk. So they get him really drunk. They get all the soldiers around him really drunk and they act like they're drinking, but you know, they just throw all their beers behind a plant or something like that. Um, and once everybody passes out, uh, they get up in the middle of the night they take Holofernes' sword, uh, they cut off his head, and then as you can see in the picture, they put it in a bag. The idea is to take it back to the Hebrews, and the Hebrews will know that the general is dead, and that will prompt them to fight back against the Assyrians, uh, which sort of kind of works. Um, so one of the reasons you might say, hey, uh, Judith, or Artemisia Janileski probably likes this because uh, there's a female hero, and that's part of it. Um, but there's also something a little bit more. Uh, so Janileski, um, part of the reason why she was able to become an artist is because her dad uh, was a rather prominent individual with some money. Uh, and she said, I want to be an artist. And he said, I'm going to make that happen. Uh, he got her a teacher, which is a pretty normal thing to do for wealthy people at that time. If you didn't have money, you had to like kind of ask the teacher uh, and they would make you do grunt work. Um, but um, this teacher um, took this young woman and did teach her how to make art, but he also um, tried to rape her. Uh, and then um, she tried to tell her dad about it, uh, and um, he was a little confused. When she went back, he actually did rape her. 
Um, so she took it to her dad, uh, and he tried to have this man, man um, brought up on charges, which he was. And often, like it happens in the modern world, it happened that he was never convicted. Um, so she had to see this guy around who had raped her and who had certainly done the same thing to others. Uh, so you can kind of imagine how this story of a heroine who takes a man's sexual desires uh, and uses it to conquer him and to lift up the people around her uh, might be particularly appealing. So since the subject had been done by Caravaggio, it's kind of violent and dramatic. Um, it was also it became her signature thing, uh, and people when they would hire her, they would ask for this subject. Sometimes it became what she was known for. Uh, but just like, again, like women today, uh, she felt like the fact that she was a woman um, meant that the way her art was received and especially how she would get paid uh, and respected um, was different than if she was a man. Um, so I think some of you um, who are women uh, may relate to some of this. And if you don't now, you may later. Uh, and those of you who are men should probably listen. So Jenna Lesky, um, she had created lots of paintings for wealthy people. That's what you want to do. Uh, and she wrote lots of letters, and they actually survived until today. And one of the letters was she had found out um, earlier that someone had um, asked her to do a painting. And what they do, and this is, this is kind of like a thing that, that they would do sometimes for artists who were inexperienced. She was already experienced at this time they would ask for drawings. Um, and she did that, even though she was really well known and really prominent and didn't really have to do this. People could look at her paintings and finish work and know that it was really good. Uh, so one of the times she did it, she found out that um, the person she gave the drawings to, who hadn't given her any money yet, gave the drawings to some younger male artist, paid him certainly a whole lot less, uh, and did it based on her drawings. Uh, so as you might imagine, she felt angry and disrespected, and also she didn't get paid uh, for this work that she did. So she wrote this letter explaining to someone else who was asked for her drawings why she wasn't going to do this anymore. She says, I fear that before you saw the painting, you must have thought me arrogant and presumptuous. If it were not for you, the most illustrious lordship, <laughs> being a little aggressive here, I would not have been, been induced to give it for 160 because everywhere else, I have been, I was paid 100 scooty per figure, so far more. She's, she's saying, hey, you're so important that I'm taking less money, but you think me pitiful because of a woman's name raises doubts until her work is seen. I was mortified to hear that you wanted to deduct one third from the already very low price that I had asked. It must be that in your heart, your most illustrious lordship finds little merit in me. I love the way she goes about this. As for my doing a drawing and sending it, tell the gentleman who wishes to know the price for a painting that I have made a solemn vow never to send my drawings because people have cheated me. In particular today, I just found myself in a situation that having done a drawing, blah, 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 in order to spend less, commission another painter to do the painting using my work. If I were a man, I can't imagine it would have turned out this way because when the concept has been realized and defined with lights and darks and established by means of planes, the rest is a trifle. So in other words, he says, I'm designing this work and then actually executing the work isn't as big of a deal as the design. Uh, and if you think about the kind of light that she's using, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Um, so she was obviously angered and made a pretty good conclusion that says uh, this is probably happening because she was alone. So this picture, now that I've been doing what I was talking, uh, most of the time when people say, what's the first thing you look at? Uh, and by the way, this is a Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, it's always out. <laughs> they never put this in the back. Uh, so check it out in person because when you walk up to it, you're going to be face to face with this head. Uh, but even with, though that's right across from you, uh, most of the time what people see first is the candle. And we see the hand and almost the way that the light falls on everything. Then we see the sword then we see the maid, and then we see the gruesome result of what they had just done. Um, so, and then there's a curtain pulled back, almost like it's a play. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that the way that Janileski makes Judith 
is quite a bit different than the way that Caravaggio makes Judith. Uh, so when you see this one, um, it's quite different than what Judith would do. I remember when I first saw this one, I thought, that's St. Polly girl from the beers. Um, and she actually used to have this part of her shirt wasn't there. Um, you can see by the look on her face that she looks very young and cute. And she also looks like, oh, this is not something I would want to do. Um, she's pretty strong, you know, maybe, but not quite as strong as the previous woman. And then they have a very old woman as the maid servant instead of the young one that's described in the Bible. And the scene is less concentrated on the power of these two women and more concentrated on the violence of what they're doing, which they don't seem to be able to do. Um, whereas when you look at this Judith, you would say, hmm, yeah, it looks like she's strong enough to like take a sword and cut somebody's head off with it. Um, she looks like she's older. Um, and then the maidservant, which is exactly how it is in the Bible. Uh, and she is the focus. Her kind of like looking out to make sure these men don't wake up and catch her. Um, and we see the act afterwards and it's not as concentrated on. She did make ones where she basically did this, uh, where you see the actual beheading. Um, but again, she always showed Judith as a larger woman who would seem to be capable uh, and never showing her as squeamish like we would see Caravaggio in this one. Uh, so this style um, that Caravaggio and Janileski were doing, it basically became they, the style of the church. Um, so this is Giuseppe Ribera, um, and this style becomes, kind of moves its way um, from Rome uh, to Spain. So Caravaggio, when he was brought up on murder charges, he fled Rome to Naples, uh, which is in southern Italy in 1606. And at that time, Naples was under Spanish rule, and he brought a bunch of paintings with him, uh, and they ended up staying there. Uh, and news of his paintings made its way to Spain because they were controlling all of these areas. Uh, and the Spanish, who were already starting their own counter-reformation, were really interested in direct spiritual experiences, like monks and nuns had already been writing about these types of things for a while. Uh, they found Caravaggio's style very appealing because uh, it was just immediate. It felt like you were right there. It was very dramatic. Uh, it made these spiritual stories into something that you could feel. Um, so with this one, St. Jerome and Angel of Judgment, a lot of times the way St. Jerome would be portrayed before this, sometimes a little bit tortured, like we saw that uh, with Parmigianino. Um, but in this one, we're really seeing the effect of what's going on. Uh, so St. Jerome... Um, he was, says here, one of the four fathers of the church. And what they mean is one of the early church figures who set up um, how the church was going to run. Uh, in the case of Jerome, he translated all the various pieces of the Bible, which were in many different languages, uh, Greek and Hebrew being the main ones. Uh, and he translated them all into Latin, which would eventually become the language of the church and last long behind. Uh, beyond spoken Latin. Um, and to do that, that was like a tremendous undertaking for one person. Like no one person would ever do something like this nowadays. Um, so it was kind of, it became a story that he did this, you know, he just kept pushing on and barely ate. Uh, and through this incredibly difficult class uh, task, he became kind of closer to the struggles of Jesus, um, to the passion of the Christ. Uh, so in this one, it's showing him as writing about Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, talking about the end of the world. It's particularly dramatic. And in Revelation, they talk about different kind of scenes in happening uh, in angels blow trumpets, and then a new scene happens. So we see Jerome, who've been translating this, like kind of literally envisioning it. We see the skull, uh, which represents a few things. Besides representing death, it means he's thinking about the passion of Christ, meaning the sacrifice of Jesus. And then we see all of his um, writings here, his translations. Uh, we know it's Jerome besides all these things because he's wearing orange, uh, and that's a popular color. So um, in Spain, uh, we kind of see this idea of being an aesthetic, of like Jerome, sacrificing yourself, 
uh, to have a spiritual experience has become very popular with monks and nuns. Uh, and so they like this kind of art where you see someone who looks like he hasn't eaten for a long time and is sacrificing himself. Uh, they also do things like they'll whip themselves or walk around with no shoes on or something like that. Um, anything to make their life harder in a physical way, which they believe might lead to uh, true spiritual experiences, ones that you can feel. Um, so the skull, again, it kind of thinks... It talks about the sacrifice of Jesus, the necessity of Christ's death for salvation. And again, just like Caravaggio, we have that tenebrism, very dark, very light. Um, the light is kind of coming down and it seems to have like a spiritual effect. He's like receiving this light. And it's also really immediate. When you stand up next to these paintings, it feels like he's right there. It's not something that's happening over there uh, or something you can walk into, but but it's you know, separated from you. Instead, it feels like you're a part of it. Um, so a lot of the Spanish paintings, they're really into these, <laughs> you might think they're like sadomasochistic or something. They're really into torture scenes. Um, and the idea is, is that these scenes, while horrific, um, at the same time, they also have a spiritual effect. Uh, so this idea that goes back to the early church, that martyrdom is almost like a cleaning uh, remember, Christians believe that there's a world that goes on forever in the afterlife. So the short life is um, the physical world for them. It's just a short life. So this used to be called the martyrdom of St. Bartholomew. <laughs> Actually, it was called that when I first started teaching not very long ago. Um, but um, And that would be gruesome. Uh, Bartholomew had talked about before. He was flayed, which means he had his, his skin peeled off. Uh, but now it's thought to be Philip. Uh, who was another one of Jesus' apostles who was crucified upside down. So pretty horrific way to die being crucified. And he says, well, I'm, I want to make it more horrific. Um, and there's a lot of interpretations of this painting. It's kind of interesting. One of the, if, one of the things that happened during the Counter-Reformation is, remember, um, church leaders are really afraid of not just losing followers, but losing their power to Protestants. Um, and as a result, uh, some institutions develop a pretty harsh reaction towards what they think could be any type of religious belief that is outside the official beliefs because they see like Martin Luther or someone like that and they say that if they believe something different, they may leave the church. Um, so they created what's called the Spanish Inquisition uh, and ostensibly what the use of it is to um, look at people who may be doing things that are outside of the church and stop them from doing it. Uh, it also became a tool for many things, like people who are part of the Spanish Inquisition, they would use it to take down their enemies, uh, especially enemies that were Jewish. It became heavily anti-Semitic. Um, and many Jewish people during this time ended up um, converting to Christianity under fear of death. Um, but people kind of recognized that this Inquisition wasn't being used and what it was, how it was claiming to be used. Um, instead, it was being used increasingly to take out whoever uh, was part of the Inquisition thought they could take out. So many people noticed that, and I put the air quotes up, that innocent people, uh, in other words, people that didn't do any, <laughs> commit any religious crimes, uh, were getting um, brought into the Spanish Inquisition uh, sometimes tortured, imprisoned, and sometimes killed. Uh, so some people think that these martyr stories where you actually see people getting tortured and killed, um, that they may be related to the Spanish Inquisition. Because instead of seeing these people going to martyrdom as being like brave and um, like they had been portrayed in previous paintings, instead you see them as they probably would be. Even if you, um, you know, we're willing to give up your life for spiritual reasons. It's still going to be scary when it actually happens. There's still going to be lots of pain. Uh, so we see that in the face of Bartholomew here. He's looking up, almost asking for help uh, to get through this torture that's about to happen. When you look at his body, it looks like he's tense all over. Um, you, you see exactly what you would expect if you were um, stringing this person up. Uh, it looks extremely painful and it looks like he's in pain. Uh, you can also see some of the people who are looking on, some of whom are interested and some who don't seem to care. 
Uh, so again, this may be related to some the sometimes public tortures that they would use in the Inquisition. Um, getting closer, you just see, yeah, you can see how his like uh, stomach is tensed up. Uh, his arms are all stretched out. You can feel the pain. You can see the blood. Uh, this isn't someone who's going bravely into torture. It's someone who does what you would expect. Um, and this white skin becomes very popular with many of the artists like we saw with El Greco. So this would be a good time to take a pause um, I would look at these two sculptures. One is from the Renaissance, we looked at before. The new one's from the Baroque, and this is actually the last sculptor we're going to talk about for a couple hundred years, and I'll talk about why when we get there. Um, but kind of compare and contrast, they're both David, uh, and remember the story of David and Goliath. You can look it up online if you don't remember from my previous lecture, and try to figure out what's different here and what's the same. Uh, so take a pause, and then I'll kind of talk about what other students do, have said in the past. So if you took a look and made a list of things that were different, probably the first, first thing you notice is that this David seems to be in motion, where this David kind of tensed up and waiting for something to happen, if something hasn't quite happened. Another thing that people notice is that, well, first off, he's partially covered up. Um, sometimes styles change. Uh, but it's still the same idea. He's kind of a new figure. But it also almost feels like when you see this one, there should be a Goliath over there uh, that's going to get hit in the head with a rock. Like you can imagine David looking at somebody else, but he also kind of works on his own. It's almost like this David has to have someone that he's about to throw this, um, that he's going to use the sling against and throw this rock at. So the David shows us just what's distinguished Baroque sculpture from that of his two preceding centuries. It's a new active relationship with the surrounding space. It rejects, rejects self-sufficiency in favor of the illusion of the presence or force implied by the action of the statue. Uh, so in other words, they start to think of art as not just existing in these discrete packets, although it's a pretty big discrete packet in the case of Dave, uh, Michelangelo's David, but they start to think of how art fits in the scenes. Uh, and fits in the environment that it's sitting in, which is what artists had done before. Uh, but the Renaissance kind of got away from that a little bit. So painting and sculpture are sometimes combined in the Baroque, what we would call multimedia. And multimedia art is pretty common nowadays. Um, so part of the things that are going on, this is Bernini. And like I said, uh, <laughs> Gian Lorenzo Bernini, like I said, this is going to be the last artist uh, the last sculptor that I'm going to talk about for a while. And part of the reason why is sculpture is expensive, and so it's hard to make changes in sculpture compared to painting, which we're going to see a ton of changes. Uh, we're not going to really see a lot of change in sculpture until we get to the 19th century, and we'll go over it then. Uh, so it's going to be a few hundred years. As you can see, Bernini lives a long time, and he's a very famous artist, so he created lots of work, and it was so influential that people didn't really change much. Um, so he's influenced by classicism, just like we saw with the Renaissance artists, but also Hellenistic sculpture. So remember I talked about the high Renaissance, and it's thought to be pretty low-key, relaxed, you don't show a lot of emotion, but we've already seen the, the Baroque painters that they love showing emotion. Uh, they love showing pain and sadness and joy and tragedy. Um, and that's what the Hellenistic, which is the, the kind of last period of ancient Greece, as far as art, art goes, um, and they also did dramatic um, types of sculptures. So um, he's influenced by the Hellenistic sculpture. Jansen said, his figure shares with Hellenistic works that unison of body and spirit of motion and emotion. Uh, so you're not necessarily going for the balance that we had seen in the Renaissance. Instead, you're going for um, all of the drama and trying to show it um, in the body. So unlike his Renaissance predecessors, the Baroque sculptor aimed to catch the split second of maximum action. Uh, and ancient Greek sculptors were fans of that too, but especially the Hellenistic ones, lots of like action scenes. So this one, we can also see like with Michelangelo's David, you see it from different angles. Uh, you might get more intensity when you see it from the side. You can see how much his mouth is kind of like tensed up uh, and how all of his muscles are tensed up. 
So it could be that this one was made to be part of an entire room designed by Bernini. Um, he was the architect of this building and the designer of this room, uh, so like the interior designer. And um, there's some evidence that he may have wanted to make a Goliath as well. So this kind of sculpture cannot be inscribed in a cylinder or confined in a niche. In other words, it seems to want to move. It seems to be uh, alive. Um, but you can answer the question like what Kleiner means in itself. Uh, and again, we see it, he's very concentrated. Uh, kind of reminds me of those pictures of Michael Jordan. Um, if he had a tongue out, it would work better. So this one again shows by Bernini, and this is probably his most famous pic, uh, sculpture, but it's not just the sculpture, it's all of this. Uh, it's multimedia, painting, sculpture, and architecture. So it creates a scene almost as if it's stage. Uh, so in England, um, the idea of what theater is uh, becomes very popular and in some of the other countries uh, in France and Italy theater starts to become more popular so a lot of times artists will think of things as, as taking place on a stage um, and that's kind of what we're seeing with the ecstasy of St. Teresa um, I happen to go there's a couple of St. Teresa's this is the one without an H in her name and I happen to go to St. Teresa Elementary School uh, which is kind of strange if you hear a story that it's an elementary school <laughs> So I know a lot about her um, and we'll kind of approach this, like she's on the stage and we'll get a little closer and we'll see the sculpture they made. Um, they have it set up now, so it has this modern lighting, but all this kind of like brass that's coming down rep represents that light like we saw in Caravaggio and Janileski's paintings and the Spanish painters. Um, it's got this stage setting. Uh, Bernini actually wrote plays and produced stage designs. So this guy was like, and in a lot of different creative professions. Uh, so when you get in close, you can see one of the things that Bernini is doing right away is he's showing how skilled he is. Um, this is amazing. Like we saw with Michelangelo's Pieta, um, he goes even further with this cloak that has like an impossible number of folds. Uh, he makes the stone so thin it could break at any moment. Uh, and the skin so smooth. So all of these contrasts show that he's an expert. Uh, but also kind of like the Baroque, if we could get close, we kind of feel like we just have these two figures. It's kind of close. It's not like what we see with David, uh, with Michelangelo's David, where we're kind of stepping back from it. Instead, again, almost the viewer feels a part of it. So Teresa was influenced by St. Jerome, this idea of to have to get closer to God, you have to kind of sacrifice. Uh, so she founded uh, a convent of nuns uh, based on aestheticism. And what they did is they didn't wear shoes, as you can see in this picture, she's barefoot, uh, and went everywhere without shoes. Um, and, you know, if you're going in cities back then or in the country, you know, that means that your feet are going to get pretty roughed up. Um, but to her, uh, these experiences, doing sacrifices, meditation, things like this could get you closer to God. So when she did it through time, she started to talk about how she had these visions and experiences. Um, so when you look at her face, like I usually ask the students, like, what do you, what does her face tell you? And kind of like what we saw with Paul, uh, it's that kind of like orgasm face. Um, and I'm sure that Bernini was thinking the same thing. Uh, because when you read what she said about her experiences, it does have that kind of idea. So first off, she went through a traumatic event. Her father died. Uh, and a lot of times when people deal with grief, uh, you know, they can't eat, they can't drink. Uh, and this could lead to things like hallucinations, so having visions. She had already been kind of sacrificing her whole life, uh, thinking about meditating on the passion of Christ. And... As she did, there's this idea, and we saw it with St. Francis before, that you can literally physically experience it. Uh, so she talks about what happens. She says, the pain was so great that I screamed aloud, but at the same time, I felt such infinite sweetness that I wished the pain to last forever. It was not physical but psychic pain, although it affected the body to some degree. It was the sweetest caressing of the soul by God. Um, so it kind of sounds like an s and thing on one hand, but her idea is that this like profound experience uh, happen 
and she could literally physically feel it in some ways. So we look at the angel and he seems to be really happy to about to stick her, stick his um, spear into our heart, which he's literally going to feel. Uh, so a lot of the artists um, and the Catholic church certainly um, and some of these nuns and priests were influenced by St. Ignatius, Loyola, uh, another person that has many s schools uh, around the U.S. And he founded what were called the Jesuits in 1534. The Jesuits, uh, in some ways, were kind of the Pope's personal uh, army of monks. And, and the army like, did things like scholarship and, and like bureaucracy and stuff like that, but they also were literally like trained fighters. Um, so he founded this order that was very loyal to the Pope and he was thinking about ways to kind of like fight against, um, the Reformation. So fighting against people leaving the church and founding, um, different forms of Christianity. And one of the ways is, is to just appeal to people on a real tangible level. Uh, and he wrote this book that was called Spiritual Exercises. Uh, and the idea was the recreation of spiritual experiences and artworks would do much to increase devotion and piety. So I figured out like getting people together and having them meditate or prayer groups or anything that could be like kind of like physical and get people to feel things uh, could keep people in the church because uh, people want experiences. Uh, that's still the case today. Uh, so he looked at artwork as one of those experiences. And if the artwork could make you feel something, uh, all the better. Uh, so when you get in close, just like we had seen with Michelangelo, uh, it becomes more and more real, like, like she's actually there. Um, and I'm showing you this last one because I'm a big fan of skulls and skeletons. That's all. So the Spanish Baroque, this is uh, Francisco de Zerberan. Seville became the home of the city in Spain, the home of the Spanish Baroque. And we're seeing, like we saw with El Greco, um, Christ on the cross. That's one of the favorite things of Spanish painting even before this, uh, and Spanish sculpture as well. Uh, and if you're Latino or Chicano, you know that that kind of brought its way over to Spain as well. Um, so we're seeing that in the crucifixion. And um, Zoran became really popular for doing um, the Saint Serapion. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that actually correctly. And it was the most popular theme, so everybody kept hiring him to do this. And um, this particular saint is another one of those martyrs from the early... Uh, he was um, founded what's called the Order of Mercy. Uh, so these are monks that went out and... Um, kind of like the modern hospitals, <laughs> um, although not capitalist. Uh, but the idea was to service the community. Um, and he was slain by pirates in 1240. Uh, so kind of shown as like, you know, fighting against the forces of evil or whatnot. But then it might not have been pirates. <laughs> it might have been during the Third Crusade. Uh, so it might have been just he was part of the people who were trying to invade Palestine or something like that and was killed uh, in 1196. So we don't know, but again, he's shown as someone that sacrifices everything. Uh, and you can see, again, we're kind of seeing that moment and we're really close in. Uh, we have really light lights and really dark darks. Um, but this is one of my favorite paintings in this whole section because it really brings together all the things that we're talking about. Uh, first off, we have a monk in meditation trying to experience the passion of the Christ. He's holding that skull, so it tells us right, right there. Uh, it's St. Francis, who was one of the early figures, a real person that lived in the 13th century, uh, who supposedly received the stigmata, meaning he meditated on the passion of the Christ so much that he got the wounds of uh, Christ in his hands and his feet and his side. Um, and we don't see all that stuff like we usually do in some of the other paintings. Instead, we just see him do what he does, like meditate. Uh, and he's on his knees. Uh, he's wearing his ratty robes, showing that he's an aesthetic. Uh, he's got the three knots, although you can't see one of them here. Franciscan monks still wear um, this belt with the three knots nowadays. Um, and his face is in shadow, but we can see that his eyes are, they rise up to the sky. And since he's so close, we can almost like get inside of his head uh, so we can have the experience that he's having. 
I include this other version of it because it's hard to tell. I haven't seen this one in person. And usually when I do, um, the darks look darker than the way that I'm showing you on the screen. And part of the reason I show them as lighter is because when you take a photograph of something, uh, you can't get the lights and darks in there the same way as they would look in real life because our eyes are much better um, at seeing um, lights and darks than a camera that is. So this last painting we're going to talk about in some ways is the most important, but he's also continuing some of the ideas that we've seen before, where you kind of tell this long story uh, that's interesting or kind of like a trick or a puzzle uh, like we had seen in the early Renaissance. Um, and you do it through the way you compose the scene, but in some ways this is more complex than anything we'd seen in the early Renaissance. So the first thing I would ask you to do was pause and try to answer these questions is what's the first thing that you look at when you look at this picture? And then once you figured it out, try to figure out, well, what is everybody else looking at? Um, and once you do that, then think of uh, where's the light falling? Because remember, these Renaissance artists love to have light direct us towards what's going on. Um, and try to figure out who is the viewer of this picture. So take a pause and try to figure that out. Um, what do you look at first? Um, what is everybody else in the picture looking at? Um, where does the light take you? And imagine you're viewing the scene in real life. Where is that viewer? Uh, so take a pause, make that stuff, and then I'll kind of talk about it. Um, so first I'll talk about Velasquez, um, who is super influential. Later artists we're going to talk about will look back at Velasquez and say, um, yeah, what he was doing was so sophisticated, I want to do this kind of stuff. Uh, so he's from Seville, where we saw the Spanish Baroque started, and he moved to Madrid, which is uh, the capital. He worked for Philip IV of Spain. Uh, Spain had been basically the wealthiest country in the, in the world when he had been born because of what they had stolen um, from the so-called New World. But they were reduced in power in some ways uh, as an individual state, uh, but they became part of a grander empire, uh, so they were able to continue their power. So he worked for Philip IV of Spain, who was certainly the most powerful person in Europe at this time and perhaps the most powerful single person in the world at this time. And this particular picture was made for Philip IV's personal gallery. Um, so that's the first thing you think, hmm, is Philip IV in this picture? He is, sort of. Um, so he was influenced by Caravaggio. You can see that with the lights and the darks. Uh, he was also influenced by Titian. So when we get in close in this painting, we're going to see some of those big, fat paint strokes uh, where you can see the individual paint strokes like Titian had done. And in some ways, this is going to be the way that Velasquez is the most influential, along with Rubens. It's going to be very painterly, meaning you can see the paint strokes. You can like literally see the hand of the artist. So um, this in the picture, we're seeing the artist studio in the palace of Alcazar in Madrid. Um, and Velasquez himself is in the picture in front of a giant canvas. It's the broke, so all canvases are giant. And then we see a bunch of paintings in the background. Uh, so oftentimes when I ask the students, what's the first thing you look at? People are like, her, Princess Margarita. Um, it's called Las Meninas. Uh, that means the maids of honor. And Princess Margarita is the daughter of Philip IV and his wife. So then... Um, that's what, you look at her because she's in the center of the picture. Um, all the light is on her, a lot of the light is on her, and some of the other people in the picture are looking at her. And if you're wondering, um, she does have like, like people who are taking care of her are other children or the adults are usually um, little people. Um, and the reason why is because a lot of times elites, they wanted their kids to know that they were more important than everybody else. Um, so they would have the only adults around them be um, dwarves or little people. Uh, and we see that some of the people in the picture, so it was the next question I asked you, uh, that they're looking at us. Even this guy in the back seems to be looking at us. And if we take, if we think about how the light takes us, we have like light coming from here and it's going here, it's going here, it's going in the back and then there's also, strangely, this thing that's lit up right here. 
Uh, so a lot of times students will read that as a painting and it just happens to have a light on it. Uh, some will read it as a mirror. So if you imagine it as a mirror, uh, and look on the trip that Velasquez has already taken us on, um, imagine that all the people that are being looked at, like how far away that person is, and then imagine if this was a mirror, we would see them. Uh, so who's that in the picture? Uh, that's Philip IV, and I'll give you a little, little close-up so you can see uh, he's a very unusual looking figure, uh, and his wife, who has a very particular hairstyle being shown there. Uh, so Velasquez is doing like a neat trick. Uh, he's making this picture, and it's seemingly, it's got him, uh, so that he's one of the subjects. It's showing him painting. That's the subject. He seems to be painting something, um, and it seems to be about his daughter because that's the first thing we look at, but then we realize everybody else is looking at the person who's looking at this picture. Uh, so he takes us on quite a trip, and it's Philip IV. So he, I think he kind of knows his audience. When somebody's really powerful, they like it when you um, challenge them, but not too much. They also like it when you show that you think they're important and they should be in everything. So that's what we're kind of seeing here. So in the background above the mirror, there's two paintings, uh, copies of Rubens. We'll talk about Rubens in a minute. Um, and... Um, the idea with it, according to Kleiner, is to show the immortal gods as sources of art. Um, so these paintings, you, I'll actually give you a link where you can look them up online, um, what the stories are. But, you know, he's kind of trying to show his greatness in a way, Velasquez, by putting them up next to these paintings. So when you get close to Velasquez, you can already see that it's painterly. Like, there's a paint stroke. There's a paint stroke. They're big chunky paint strokes and artists over by this time are already thinking when you do that it shows your style only you can do it and nobody else can do it so he's knighted in the order of santiago by philip the fourth and he decides to put himself in this uh vest that he was given to show that he's a knight um so you know artists sometimes they can be knights like elton john uh when we get in close to um Princess Margarita, I don't think the drink was named after her, by the way. You can see it's very painterly. Individual paint strokes. When you see her from far away, she seems so real. When we get in close, we see the hand of the artist. So this painterly technique is what everybody's going to be doing for a while. And then in the background, we can see this guy with a suspiciously large chin. Uh, and <laughs> this woman with a very interesting and unique hairstyle. So almost everyone agrees this is the two of them because it can't really be anybody else. Uh, so that's the Princess Margarita's parents, the king and the queen. But it's from our point of view as if it was a mirror and they were standing in a way that all the people looking at us, the viewer, are actually looking at Philip and his wife. So Philip, uh, he, was a, he was a Habsburg. Uh, and like a lot of European families, uh, the Habsburgs, they, were, they had power in many different countries at different times. Um, but they were also inbred <laughs> because sometimes they can't find anyone outside of the family that they think will be loyal enough. And when you do that for many years, sometimes it brings out unusual features. So one of them is the so-called Habsburg chin. Uh, they tend to have problems with their jaw. Uh, and because they're not getting genetic diversity, it just kept continuing. Uh, and they also had some, uh, some of the the children had problems with like cognitive deficiencies like mental illness and things like that uh, and just physical deformities um, so I got that might be like a kind of gentle look at his face uh, and then the background you don't know there's a million different ideas on who it could be it could be Don Jose Nieto Velasquez uh, who's a relative maybe a relative of Velasquez. One thing you learn about Spain is there's not a whole lot of last names. Uh, and there's reasons for that. Um, you can kind of look up the reasons, actually pretty interesting. Um, or it could be the Queen's Chamberlain, which is just a fancy word for a uh, valet, um, but he's also a keeper of the tapestries. So basically like the house manager. Um, and it could be him, but he seems to be like pulling back a curtain. There's kind of like mysteries to it. So I'll, I'll give you this link uh, but this is the last artist we're going to talk about in this section in, in, in some ways, uh, as far as the Italian and Spanish broke, uh, the best one to end with because he's going to be the most influential in some of the pictures that we're going to look at later on.